I'm going to start recording. <clears throat> I'm glad you're all here. I really am. Thank you for making the effort and taking the time to come to this review session. Um, I'm not sure what to do about cameras. Since it's a review session and it's optional, if I guess if you want to have your cameras on, fine. If you don't, fine, right? What do you guys think? It's optional. Yay, that's a good yes. Yeah, okay. I'm still in my PJs. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Alex. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> All right, show of hands. Who wants to keep cameras off if you want to, since it's optional? Okay. But that doesn't mean if your camera's off, that doesn't mean you can't not participate because this is pretty, this is really interactive. This is for you. This is not for me. This is for you. All right. So you need to use the next, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. Um, I'm hoping that everybody had a chance to review the study guide. Well, at least what I tell my students is before you come to a review session, I would suggest that you review your study guide, add your notes in onto the study guide from class, review, <coughs> review um, anything on the <coughs> notes and study guide that doesn't make sense. And let's use this time to review, right? Not to teach, but to review. Um, you should be well aware of what was covered in weeks one and two um, and then you have a look at the study guide make sure all that content has been covered which it should be or at least the topics are introduced the concepts are talked about right and then you come to this review with questions and clarifications okay all four of the professors are doing reviews there was two done yesterday i'm doing one now and then um, I think Professor Alani is doing the one tomorrow. So we, we all have the same information. We're covering the same chapters. We just present it in different ways. So for me, I'd like to simply use a study guide. That's the way I do my reviews, right off the study guide. Okay, I don't use the hoots and PowerPoints and all that. I'm not to say it's not helpful. Everybody has their own teaching style, but I do straight up PowerPoint. Okay. Um, and it's worked for me for the last five terms. So I'm going to keep going that way. I take lots of notes on my study guide. Um, and so that's what I do. Okay. So again, welcome to um, review for exam one. Um, I'm really happy to have you all here. Thank you. If you haven't already put your name, campus and professor in the chat, <coughs> excuse me, um, please do. And I apologize fighting off a little cold flu here. So but at least I'm here, right? At least I'm here. Um, so let's get going. A um, couple of things, a uh, couple of my little mantras. Um, <clears throat> I've seen it for five terms. Um, we do see, we do see a ac uh, an actual imp increase in exam scores for students that have attended live reviews. Okay, so that's a good thing. You're all here. That's a good thing. Um, so there's a direct correlation for attending. Hi, Tashana. Um, there's a um, direct correlation of attending live reviews versus listening to recordings. If recordings is all you can do, that's all, all you can do. We know a lot of people work on the weekends, and that's why we tried to offer a couple on Fridays as well. Um, so um, also, we encourage you to go to as many as you can. I don't know, is anybody... Is anybody, did anybody go to uh, reviews yesterday? Yeah. yeah oh, good, 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 good. And how were they? They were good. good. And Professor Apple, did she use her PowerPoints? Yeah. She did. Yeah. Right off yeah. the PowerPoint. Yep, yep, yep. Cool, cool. Okay. Well, that's great, great. Because I am a firm believer in um, really doing well, well, doing well on all exams, but really doing well on exam one. Okay. Because what we find is if, um, you know, if you struggle for exam one, you're kind of playing catch up the whole term and that's fine. You do what you need to do. But remember in this class, there's only four KGAs, right? There's three exams and a HESI, right? Weeks three, five, and three, six, and nine. Right. So, um, again, if you if you can articulate the study guide, 
for this exam, um, you'll be you'll do good. You'll do good. You know, the study guide is obviously a summary and a compilation of what we've covered the last two weeks. OK, and we've tried to pull out the important topics, concepts, information from each chapter that um, to us um, is essential knowledge that you guys need to be responsible for um, when you take the exam. So that's what these study guides are. OK, so let's get going. Um, <clears throat> so let's oh, let me share my screen. Pull up the study guide. Can everybody see that? Yes. yes. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the what? Thank you. The one thing that we need, do need to add here. I don't know if I can. Can I edit this? We need to add chapter ten. Right? Is it in there? No. We need to add chapter ten. So we're covering um, chapters one, two, three, and twenty-one and ten from week one, and chapters eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and thirty-one from week two. Okay. Um, multiple choice, 50 questions. Um, there'll be, you know, pick an answer, multiple choice, select all that apply, and there'll be some math problems. 75 minutes. Um, here's a, some bullets of what kind of math questions um, you might get. Um, IV calculations. You guys all have this. So I'm just uh, reviewing it. Determine equivalence, converting between systems of measurement, oral and parental me medication, and medication dosages for kids. Okay. I've sent you at least my students, <laughs> I've sent you numerous math resources, right? Um, I think that you should definitely have a look if you need some math support. Um, this past week, I sent you that recording from Dean Brown that she did. Uh, I think the two terms before with students, um, excellent, excellent um, um, recording to listen to if you need some math support. And then you guys also have access to calculating with confidence, right? It's in your student resources. So make sure you take a look at that if you need some support. Okay, excellent, excellent resource, calculating with confidence. I use it. Um, as well um, to refer to if I need to. So really excellent resource. Um, so let's see, um, review math handouts and do practice questions. So I've sent, I've sent along three or four math resources to you guys. Um, case studies, um, at least my students, um, they know case studies for me are really, really important. Um, I know I have my students here. Why are case, why do I encourage you to review chapter case studies? Alicia? Helps with critical thinking and applying the knowledge that we're learning. Yes, that's part of it. Yes, absolutely. But the rationales. The rationale. Rationales. Rationales, right? Whenever you have the opportunity to review rationales, whether it's NCLEX, Kaplan, case studies, rationales, in my opinion, an excellent, excellent source of learning as well. Okay, so each, <coughs> pardon me, each week, you should get your PowerPoints, um, and you should get the case studies. Okay, these are instructor case studies that we get with our teaching plans. I send those out every week. I think I really encourage you to review those. I tried to get to them in class, but a lot of times we run out of time, but I do want you to look at those case studies. Okay, so I'm here. Case study applications. Um, we're all we're looking at assessment and prioritization, management of care. Okay, remember, say, <clears throat> pardon me, safety. Pardon me. Um, remember, safety first, prevention levels related to each chapter and nursing process, which is your ADPI. What are we doing in community? We are applying our ADPI to the community setting, correct? ADPI in the clinical setting looks very different than ADPI in the community setting, but it's all the same thought process. So that's one of the things you have to master in this class is being able to shift your ADPI from the clinical setting to the community setting. Lots of examples in the book of how to do this, and we'll talk about this. The other... Um, it, you have to master knowing the differences between primary, secondary, and tertiary. There's probably, I would say, half a dozen questions on each exam that are primary, secondary, and tertiary. We have to get that down pat, okay? And so um, pro, this is in your study guide, so we'll review that. But um, 
their primary prevention and secondary is in every chapter <clears throat> of the book. And they give specific examples in each chapter, um, depending on what the topic is. So whether it's uh, family assessment, family risks, um, history of public health, uh, introduction to community nursing, you have to be able to apply primary, secondary, tertiary to each of those um, each of those topics. The other thing that you need to review, um, I'm kind of getting off the beat here, but anyway, um, that's fine. There's three things, there's three things in each chapter that you should review. Well, there's two priority things, but one third thing that I think is helpful too for understanding of uh, competencies. You need to review Healthy People 2020 goals and objectives, right? They're different for every chapter and their goals and objectives are applied to each topic, whatever topic we're on. You need to review the levels of prevention in each chapter to get an understanding of how to apply different levels to different topics. And I, I encourage my class to review the QSEN box, Q-S-E-N, okay? And that is the uh, safety and education with in nursing. Okay, it's competencies, that's what it is. Chapter one's QSIN box introduces you to the six competencies that will be covered through the whole term. And then going forward, each chapter breaks down one of those competencies and how it, that competency is applied to that chapter. Really, really helpful information, really helpful. So if you get the opportunity, I would suggest you review those three boxes. Okay, the way I explain it to my class is that when I send the PowerPoint and the case studies, those are meant to be reviewed ahead of time. Um, the PowerPoint is simply an outline of the chapters, right? It's not any new information. The PowerPoint was made from the chapter, okay? And so the very first part of the chapter, when you go to the book that's in blue that says chapter outline, that's your PowerPoint. So my expectation is that you review the PowerPoint to know what we're going to be covering this upcoming week. And then we spend most of lecture in the book talking about that PowerPoint, explaining the important concepts and talking about them. Okay. So there's your health, your healthy people 2020. Okay. It's not an all-inclusive study guide, helpful hands, best practice to prepare for the exam is to review your notes and recordings. Okay, and remember, <clears throat> remember, for week one, we covered the orientation PowerPoint. So however your professor got you week one information, week one content information, please review it. Um, because nobody covered content information in, in week one, it was all orientation, whether you covered it in week two, I have no idea. I did a recording and sent it out to my group. <clears throat> but remember to review that recording. Don't skip over that recording if you at least my group, but make sure you know your chapter one content, however you received it, okay? Um, readings, projects, discussions, um, Zoom review. We always send out our recordings after, um, after our lecture, or excuse me, we send out our Zoom recordings to our students. So listen to those if you haven't. And then with these um, review sessions, we all share recordings. Um, so I'll be sending this recording out to all the other professors and they'll show, share with you, share with everybody. So for example, last night, I took the two recordings from um, Professor Price and Professor Apple and I sent them on to my three sections. So you have two of the four, all right? And then today you'll have a third one and tomorrow you'll have a fourth one, okay? So you should have plenty of opportunity, okay? That's my mantra. Do we have any questions? <coughs> any questions? No, ma'am. All right, let's get going. So what I'd like to do is pull out the important points in each bullet. And then I like to try and guess what kind of questions might you be asked on the exam? So um, this is broken up into several several uh, sections, okay? Priority and safety assessment. So this is your ADPI, your safety and delegation, safety and delegation principles. And then we talk about um, <clears throat> um, 
legislation organizations that play a role in public health, management of care across the lifespan, school nursing, family assessment, vulnerable populations. So none of this should be unfamiliar to you. These are all topics we covered. Okay. And so, um, so um, basically um, this section right here, this priority and safety assessment is your chapter 20, just to keep you guys organized. Okay. So you're not running around looking for information. I like to try and give you at least uh, some heads up. Okay. So most of these bullets are covered in chapter 20. What was 20? Guys, remember what chapter 20 was? No, wait, did you say 20? Eighteen, nineteen. Oh yeah, yeah. Twenty. Twenty oh. was health risk oh. across the lifespan. Okay. Yep. I just found it. Thank you. Health risk across the lifespan. That's a lot of information. I mean, think of, think about health risks across the lifespan. Think of how many how many clients we might be working with: infants, children, adolescents, teenagers, adults, men, women, special populations, um, uh, elderly, right? Um, so lo lots, lots of kinds of, uh, clients who might be working with. So this one says, I'm not going to go through every one of these. I'm just showing you how we, how I like to review this. So for example, the first one is risk factor for SIDS. Okay. Include, and you're given all the risk factors. Okay. So if you have a question about SIDS, what might your question be? How should we position the baby when they're sleeping? Yeah. What are the, sure. What are the risk factors? Right. They're given to you right here. Risk factors. Okay. So we need to know about SIDS, what the risk factors are. Exactly. How should you position? Um, should you be sleeping on a soft versus hard surface? Uh, surface? What about uh, maternal smoking? Does that impact SIDS? Yeah. A, yeah, of course it does. So, um, so that's what we need to know about SIDS. Uh, what happens if there's uh, late or no prenatal care? Does this put them at uh, the mom at higher risk? Of course. Age. Okay. Let's see interventions that need to be based on goals of lifestyle changes for the entire family. You know, what if what what if the family has a history of obesity? Okay. Interventions needed need to be based on goals and lifestyle changes in the family. So let's say you're doing a family assessment and you go to the house and determine that all the kids are obese. Okay, what are some interventions? Uh, obviously your goal is to modify the way in which the family eats, exercise and plans daily activities, but what are you gonna teach? Remember in that chapter. So, so let's say you can't answer that question from looking at the study guide. What do you do? Go to chapter 20. Go to chapter 20. And I can tell you right now, there's a, there's a box in the book when it starts talking about family risks. And the first box is obesity. Right? Remember that? And it gives you ways to, in, ways to, teach, ways, ways to teach families about um, prevention, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So go look at that box. Right. You're you're trying to help that family um, modify if their kids are already obese or educate if they're not. And you want to work towards prevention. Does that make sense? So that's how I look at the study guide. If you cannot articulate this, then you need if you can't articulate this second bullet. And you're thinking, oh, what what are that? What are we talking about here? You need to go back to ch chapter 20 and look. Okay. Mm -mm. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, again, let's look at the next one. Review. This is pretty straightforward. Review 2020 principle, healthy people 2020 principles on safety for adolescents. Okay. So you're going to be going back to chapter 20 and reviewing your healthy people 2020 box. Right. Remember we talked about violence, weapons, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, motor vehicle. Where are those risks happening? 
well, motor vehicles with the adolescents, right? Because they're the ones that are just starting to drive, right? Remember, these are the leading causes of morbidity, morbidity and mortality for adolescents. No why and nursing interventions. So you need to go back and review the section in chapter 20 that is adolescent risks. Make sense? Okay, under safety assessments, right? What are some common things that you should be looking for, environmental things you'd be looking for when assessing the playground? I know we talked about this in class, right? Let's say you're part of a, you're the new community nurse in the community and the community just got a big grant. They're gonna build a big playground outside the rec center. And they come to you and say, how do we build a playground? You know, what safety, what safety <coughs> considerations do we have to take in place <clears throat> into account? Okay. So here we're asking, know what you would put, know what would put a child at risk, your priority intervention, safety and recommendations. There's a box in chapter 20 that talks about playground safety, right? What, what are the do's and what are the don'ts? Okay. I have a question. Did yeah. they did they get rid of the slides because it was uh, choking kids? I don't think so. I know they got rid of the um, the, high, the, the metal one. What? The metal they ones? The metal ones. The metal stuff. Okay. I know they got rid of like um, ropes to hang down, or at least those are the guidelines in chapter twenty of the book. Um, um, singles or was it double swings instead of single swings? Just have a look at, just make a note to go back and look at that box in chapter 20. Okay, let's skip down here. Tertiary, here's a tertiary prevention right here, middle of the page. How does this come into play when doing planning of care for a child diagnosed with a chronic condition? Look at how the community nurse would make recommendations to assess interventions. So you have a <clears throat> child with a chronic illness. They already have the illness. Now you're, you're asked, what would be some tertiary preventions? So what are we doing with that child? What's First of all, what's tertiary? Management, the disease. Yep. Rehabilitation. Yep. So what would we be doing? Tertiary, they already have the disease. Teaching Make, them how to be training it. How about assessing the family to make sure they're able to care for the child, right? Can, you know, a lot of kids with chronic conditions require lots of follow-up um, medical, um, what, I don't, PT, OT, doctor's appointments. Is the family able to manage all that? Can they keep up, keep up with all that? Is the child be able to attend you know, are they able to, if the parents work, are they able to provide care for the child when they're at work? And how does that look? So that's your, ter that's your assessment, right? Yes, we have a child in the home with chronic conditions. Can the family manage it? Right? I want to go, let's see. <clears throat> I want to go back to safety assess. I want to go back up here. Okay, I wanna review something with you here. I'm back up here on review 2020 principles. Weapons, okay? When you're doing a home visit, the, what is the first question you ask? Are there any weapons in the home? Correct. If the answer is no, okay. If the answer is yes, what? What's next? Ask them how they're stored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you is it locked, locked away? Okay, that's all right. But do you want to see that or not? Yes, yes I do want to see how it's yes. stored. Just Absol to confirm for confirm. Just to confirm that is absolutely bingo. Okay, so you so yes, we have weapons in the house. Can you please show me where they're stored? Okay, you have to make sure they are they are stored 
appropriately. Right? Okay. Um, okay, I want to go here. Let's do this one. Review concepts of prevention when it comes to smoking and children diagnosed with chronic conditions. How would a community do primary and tertiary prevention? Think about ADPI and prioritization. How would you create a nursing plan that addresses things like asthma as secondhand smoke? Okay, so let's think about this. When you have a home that there are smokers in and there are kids in there and you start to work with the family, what is your end goal? To have them stop smoking? Smoke-free home, <laughs> right? How they get there is up to, I'm going to have... Can I mute somebody? Yeah. Okay. Um, how we get there is up to you. Okay. What things can you, what primary, well, let's start with primary. You go into, um, you go into a house, you go into a house that the question you asked, is, it smells like smoke. Does somebody smoke in the house? Yes. Okay. Let's jump to tertiary actually. What kinds of things could you do as the nurse, think of ADPI, to help this family move towards the end goal of a smoke-free home? What could you do? You can assess and, assess and see how many packs of cigarettes they smoke and mm -hmm. try to get them to cut down maybe from, one, from two to one pack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's... <laughs> unrest to the children. Yeah. Remember, yep, yep, yep. So you you have a lot of tools in your toolbox. Maybe you because remember you're there, you're the community resource nurse, so you have lots of resources. Maybe there's smoking cessation classes. Maybe you do education on the risks uh, to the children long term with secondhand smoke. Okay. But your goal is a smoke-free home. What if they say, hey, don't worry. Um, I cut down from four packs to two packs a day. And there's still smoker in the house. Is that like huge? Not really. No. What if they, what if they say, um, I'm vaping now. Don't worry about it. I'm vaping. It's all set. It's still not. Okay. What if they say, hey, I I'm smoking outside now. Is that better? Yes. Definitely better. All right. So when you look, if you get a question about this, you have to prioritize, right? What's the best answer? Okay. If they're going outside, that's better. Or if they've cut down or they're vaping or, you know, they, um, they, they move to smoking to another room instead of, you know, the kitchen out in the, whatever. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, okay, let's understand difference between primary, secondary, tertiary, be able to distinguish. Okay, what's primary? I do P for P, S for S, T for T. What's primary? <coughs> like vaccines. Okay, that's for an example, but what are we looking for? Prevention. Beginning prevention. P, prevention. prevention. Education. Prevention. Okay. Hang on and to education. the word hang on to the word education for a minute because I want to explain that a little bit further because it's education at every level. And I don't want you to get tripped up with education just being primary. All right, so primary, primary is prevention. What's secondary? Screening. 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 And for my group, what's tertiary? Treatment. 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 I have a, I have a question. Say that again. Treatment. I like to do P, P, S, S, T, T, just one word, okay? You have to be careful about education because education is involved at every level, okay? Education in the primary is what? You're trying to teach to prevent. So would, so would like um, teaching someone about a self-breast exam would be primary and if they were doing the self-breast exam, that would be them screening would be secondary? We sure. were talking about this yesterday and yep. we didn't. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, so, okay, let's use that as an example. So who is that? Is that Alex? 
Yes, I can I can only see three names here. I can only, yeah, two names. I can only see two people. So let's use Alex's example. Okay. We're going to be, we're, the topic is breast self exams. What is a primary intervention? Teach them how to do just it. Teaching the client. Yes. Teaching them how to do it. Okay. So secondary is screening. So essentially, you've taught them how to do it. And so secondary is going to be them doing their own screening, whether it's it's you doing the screening, the client doing the screening themselves, or them going to see the primary care once a year and the primary care does a self-exam. They're screening. Okay. Let's take it a step further. And we're in tertiary now. Let's say there's an issue. An issue is found. There's some kind of a breast cancer found. Okay. Then what? What are your interventions? What's a tertiary? Be surgery. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Sir, tertiary is whatever the doctor decides. Does that make sense? So, yes, so let me take let me take you back to education with this topic. Education is uh, on the primary level is teaching to prevent. In this time with this topic, education on the secondary level is let's say there is, um, I don't know, let's say they find something of concern based on the, the breast self exam. Then you do education, right? I, I also think of secondary as early identification, kind of early identify, early identification, early intervention. So education on the secondary level is for the people that may be at risk, why is it important to screen? Make sense? So you're teaching them, you know, it's like screening for um, BMI in schools. Why are you screening? Because you're trying to pull out who may be at risk, right? So there's education at the secondary level. And then there's also education at the tertiary level. Let's say it is breast cancer. Well, there's a lot of education that goes along with that too. You know, how, what's the treatment going to be? What kind of cancer is it? What's the risk of reoccurrence? So don't get tripped up with education just being in the primary level. That's my point. Got it? Okay, thank you. Can I uh -huh. ask you something, Ms. Marvel? Yep, go. Now, um, I wanted to say about secondary, like um, someone had a, uh, colon cancer in their family and the doctor told them that they need to get uh, make sure they had a colonoscopy that would be secondary screening absolutely oh. great example great example yes absolutely i have a i have one more question uh, so if someone has like the uh, brca1 gene so they got the screening if the BRCA they, gene? yes ma'am okay um if they so then would it go back to primary if they're trying to prevent it, if they had like some sort of surgery? Because they don't actually have the disease, but they have the gene for the disease. Okay. So you could go back to primary and teach because they don't have the disease yet and teach them <clears throat> if they carry the BRCA gene, what would be, what would they be at risk for? How could they help stay healthy or, you know, just education on, yes, you have it, but here's some things you can do to prevent or maybe try and mitigate you being at risk. I mean, we it's already so know they're at risk, but go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, if they got, so if they got a mastectomy, would it be a primary prevention because they don't have it? Well, if they got a mastectomy, that's really a tertiary prevention from a risk that was identified because okay. you're actually treating it. You're, we're, treating, we're treating it, but they don't have it. That's well, you just said they me. had a mastectomy. Right. Um, so, so, they... so you're treating the risk. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, and then the other thing here, don't forget to, we talked about this in class, home visits, um, one of the primary concerns for home visits is your safety. 
right? So in page, let's see, um, this, this, this one you'd go back to right here, chapter uh, box eight, right here. Here's all your information. Go back and review box 18.5 on 302, home visiting safety tips. Okay, you will get asked about this. Okay, because it's that important. We want you to know that if you are doing a home visit, what are the safety tips that we recommend? Not we, but the book, the top, the topics, home visits, what do we recommend? Okay, so please go back and review that box. Okay, uh, next section, um, acts and organizations that play a role in public health, right? Review the Family Medical Leave Act. Okay, how does it impact communities and families? What is the Family Medical Leave Act? <laughs> it's Family Medical Leave Act is I or you should have every opportunity to take time off from work to care for a sick family member. Okay. How does it impact communities and families? Very much so. If we have a sick community, a sick family member, and kids are having to go to school and parents are having to go to work and, you know, um, how are we going to, can somebody take family medical leave to care for that family member? So know that. Okay. Why would a nurse choose public health? Well, um, if you're asked a question of, you know, I'm thinking about going into public health, what's the benefits? Um, well, the two benefits are autonomy and independence. Go back and take a look at Frontier Nursing Services. Um, these two, these two bullets right here, second and third bullet, are from Chapter Two. Go back and read the section on Frontier Nursing Services. But it says right here, no Frontier Nursing Services primary focus was vaccinations. What was another primary focus of Frontier Nursing Services? You guys, remember? Do they do a uh, like midwife? They, yeah, the introduction to midwifery. Yes, yes, good job. Yes. Okay. But for purposes of this study guide, uh, Frontier Nursing Services was vaccinations. Okay. What's the purpose of Healthy People 2020? And how does it impact objectives for school nursing program outcomes? So, reading that, what does that tell you? You should go back and review. I don't know why this is here. This should be in the school nursing section, but what does that tell you? You should go review. Healthy People 2020. In chapter 31, right? Because chapter 31 is school nursing. Ah, here's my QSIN, right? What are the competencies? What are the safety, quality and safety education for nurses? What are the competencies? I can tell you right now where you go find that your six competencies go back to chapter one. There's a box. It introduces how QSIN is going to be, um, how QSIN is going to be studied throughout the term and what the competencies are and how to review the boxes. Really excellent information. Okay, so go back to chapter one and they're asking what are the competencies? Know the six competencies. Okay. Um, and then, okay, so let's look at this. Here, let's look at this question, or let's look at this bullet. There's a lot of information in this bullet. It's asking you, what's the CDC? Oh, sorry. Oh, come on, out of there. Who's the who, right? Who's the who? What's the NCHS? What's the Institutes of Medicine? So what is this? This is definitions, right? And it tells you it tells you right in the bullet what each of them what each of them are responsible for in very short version. What does the CDC do? What does the who do? Remember the who, is international, global, World Health Organization, global health, CDC, 
provides the most current guidelines in public health nursing. So if you're asked, um, let's see, if you're asked what agency, what organization do public health, does public health nursing rely on the most? What's your answer? CDC. If you're asked, thank you. If you're asked, um, if you're given a scenario about international or global immunization program, goals and objectives for global immunization program, who's gonna be involved in that? The World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about if you are given the scenario that new policies are being developed that impact overall public health? Who's going to be overseeing that? Last Institution line. Institutional medicine? Yeah. Right. And then if you're given a scenario that's that's talked talking about, uh, you know, how do we collect data on population or demographics of different areas of population? Who's going to be overseeing that? The NCHS. What does that stand for? I knew you're going to ask me that. I knew you're going to we're going to have to you're going to have to go back to Chapter three and get that information. National. Chill, is it the, uh, you're gonna have to go back. Alex, how about this? Since you asked the question, go back to chapter three and let us all know what that is by the time we finish. How's that? National Center for Health Statistics. Oh, well, that makes sense. It's focused on population demographics. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, so with that being said, you, you may get a, a scenario. Like I just gave you, I gave you four different scenarios. Pick the one, at, pick the one who will be overseeing that. Make sense? Okay, really important to know the difference between advocacy and social injustice. There is a difference. Okay, this is in chapter 21. <coughs> Does it help to give you the chapters to go back? Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, yes. thank you. All right, um, okay, what's the difference between advocacy and social justice? Okay, you can review this. I know you know the difference right? Advocacy. As nurses, we're advocates all the time, right? It's, it's what actions we take on, on, be, on behalf of another. So we are, we are client advocates. We are patient advocates. We are family advocates. We are every kind of advocate, okay? So know the difference between those, these two, and it gives you the definitions right here right here. Okay, so you may be asked, um, here's a scenario. Um, does this refer to, will, will, will the nurse need to look at the concept of the top concept of advocacy or social injustice to, to work with this client or family? Okay, what's the primary goal of public health? Primary goal of public health, right here. The prevention of disease and disability. Okay, here in this little section, go back to, I think we're still in chapter 21, I believe, but no, this is, I think, chapter one. You need to understand the difference between community-oriented nursing, community-based nursing, and population-focused nursing. Simple. population. Focused nursing is what? You're focusing on what? Population. Here's how I remember the difference between community-oriented, community-based, and my group has already heard this. I think of community-oriented is the big picture. You are trying to get oriented to the community. You're trying to learn everything about the community that you need to know for your community assessment. Right. You need to know what are the risk populations, you know, think, think of that walking into a new community. You're the new community health nurse. You know nothing about it. A new job, new, new state, new. How are you going to get yourself educated about the community? That's community oriented nursing. Big picture. OK, you you're focused on um, healthy lifestyles, healthy, healthy community. Community-based, on the other hand, 
is, this is the way I remember it, you're based, you're based in the community. You're already working in the community with the families. You're working with illness, issues, illness. Okay? That's the way I remember it. Okay? Uh, public health nursing has a population-focused practice. Right? That's what public health is. Right? It's population-focused. Okay? So public health nurse works to understand the problems and solutions of, of a defined population. Right? We may be looking at male versus female issues, young versus old issues, ethnic issues, um, subpopulations, right? Remember our community, when we're in community nursing, our client could be a single individual. It could be a whole family. It could be the entire community population, or it could be aggregates of the population. Right here, families, individuals, Okay, or the whole population, or say the homeless population, or the HIV population, aggregates. That's what aggregates mean, subsets of the population. So, as a public health nurse, you're looking at the whole population, or you're looking at a population focused practice, but that could look different. Population focused practice could be an individual, could be a family, could be the homeless, could be <clears throat> women in the community, could be, <clears throat> pardon me, men in the community. Make sense? So public health nurse, yeah, we just read that. Okay, public health policies. What, what else do public health nurses do? We Well, we help create policies in our community. My community is gonna look different from all of yours. All of our communities look different that we live in. Okay, so um, public health policies, We obviously the goal is to decrease mortality related to issues in your community. Here it talks about communicable diseases. Right. We know that in all communities, one of the leading causes of mortality is shifted to chronic diseases. Why? Why? That's in every community. Why is it shifted to chronic diseases? People are living longer. Exactly. Right. Right here. The increase in the number of older adults and there's two things here. The increase in the number of older adults and increasing population. So age and number has created a huge challenge for public health nursing. Okay. Next, this is important. If you're asked, why, why is the population of the world increasing? What are your answers? What, you only have two answers. What are they? Um, more people and we're living longer. Let's see. Right here, increase fertility rates and decrease mortality rates. So if you're asked, why is the population of the world increasing? These are the only two right answers, according to the book. Okay, those are the primary reasons. There may be a hundred secondary reasons behind that. All right, people are living longer doing, and, or maybe the question is why? Why are people living longer? People are living longer due to advances in health care, care, vaccination, screening tools. So there's a couple of ways a question could be asked about this right here. What are the reasons, two reasons that the population of the world is increasing? And the other question could be why? Why are people living longer? Right? What and chapter here, is this? Um, I have 21. But I... I have 21, but it could be, it could be back in chapter two. You have to search one of those two. I think it's 21. Okay. Next section, management of care across the lifespan. Okay. This is big. Okay. <coughs> I have, this is all broken up. I have. Um, the first bullet from chapter 20. Okay, this is important. We need to understand this. I'm going to talk about this. Okay, we already we just learned that we're going to be caring for a lot of older adults, right? Because that's our big concern in public health now is patients are living longer. Okay. 
we need to, you need to understand this. Unless the patient has been declared incompetent, we want the patient to be able to participate in their own care, right? And so what kinds of things would we be doing? Okay, unless the patient is declared incompetent, the patient should be able to have the right of self-determination, meaning they need to be involved in their care. That includes their health plan of care, their living plan of care, you know, where they live, their finances. So, you know, if, and this is where we introduce elder abuse, okay? If the patient is declared incompetent, then yes, things need to be put in place. But if the patient is competent, we want them participating in their care. So would you be able to recognize signs of elder abuse, physical, emotional, financial, right? Let's say, let's say um, a relative, the patient's competent, um, they've been doing their finances forever. They do their own checkbook, they pay their own bills, they do this, they do that, they're fine. And let's say a family member wants to take that over without the involvement of the client. Who is competent? Is that a problem? Yes. Why? Because the individual can take care of themselves or they're competent. Right. Right. And again, think we're, think, we're starting to talk about elder abuse here. Okay. At least with the risks. Now, think about you're taking care of a chronic client. What as a nurse could you do? Here, here's some goals right here. Appropriate goals. We want to maximize self-care capacity. We want to manage chronic diseases effectively. We want to try and prevent complications. This isn't taking care of elderly, anybody with chronic diseases. Delay deterioration or decline. Achieve the highest possible quality of life before, before dying with comfort, peace, and dignity. Okay, so what can't we prevent? Here's the message. What can't we prevent with taking care of clients with chronic diseases? Their death? Correct. We can't prevent death, but we can do all these things in here to help, right? To help with the rest of the quality of life so that when they finally die, it's with comfort, peace, and dignity. That's the one thing you have to understand. We can't cure chronic disease and we can't prevent death. Okay. All right, let's jump to school nursing, chapter 31. This whole section is chapter 31. Okay. So it tells you right here, review Healthy People 2020. So go to the box in chapter 31. All right, review the duties of the school nurse with regards to vaccinations. What that means, you know, we have a national vaccination program, federal. You know, no, no vaccinations, no school, unless there's certain exemptions. What do you do with a family who, for religious reasons, medical reasons, personal reasons, don't want to do vaccinations? Um, what do we do? How do we teach primary, secondary, and tertiary when we're encountering certain things in the school, such as conjunctivitis, lice, obesity? Think ad pie and interventions. So, for example, vaccinations. Yes, if we have a family that doesn't want to get vaccinated, I just finished 20 years of school nursing. I had this all the time. If they don't want to get vaccinated, they do their exemption, whatever, religious, personal, medical. But we are still responsible for teaching them and educating them of the risks of not being vaccinated. Right? I can't you know, put the kids back in a corner, you know, uh, the unvaccinated, you know, may, they're the first families we call if there's a, there's a outbreak of pertussis, right? That we have a short list in each school, kids who are unvaccinated for pertussis. Those are the first families we call if there's an outbreak or chickenpox, whatever, and say, hey, there's been an outbreak. You're gonna, our recommendation is to keep, you keep your kid out of school until this outbreak um, is over because your kid is at very high risk of getting pertussis or chickenpox or whatever. 
So we still have a role. That's my point. Even, and then what kinds of kids might not be vaccinated? You know, if it's not medical, religious, personal, maybe they, maybe the family doesn't have the resources to get them to a clinic. You know, what, what populations are more at risk for not having their kids vaccinated? That's all in that chapter. Go back and it's all in that school nurse chapter. Go back and read that. Okay, because there's two issues with vaccinations. Um, vulnerable populations that might have not have access to it. And then there's the exemptions. Okay. Do you guys know about conjunctivitis? What does it look like? Could you spot it? What are the signs? What are the symptoms? What's the treatment? Same with lice. Okay. And then this third bullet is priority. Okay, which ailments have presented with various ones that a child could present with to the school clinic would take priority over the other? <clears throat> Think of your ABCs. Let's say you got a question here that said, a kid came to the clinic with A, B, C, D, E, you know, all the way from um, a scratch on the knee from falling in the playground to a kid having an asthma attack. I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there. Which is the priority? Which kid would you take care of first? Asthma. Of course. So, so this, this bullet is all about prioritization, being able to prioritize using your ABCs. Okay. Again, how to manage signs and symptoms of conjunctivitis, hand washing, warm compresses, affected areas. So that's the second time conjunctivitis has been mentioned. It's up here. So what does that tell you? This on the test. Well, I wouldn't say it like that, but you should probably know how to take care of conjunctivitis. I can't say it like that. It's on the test. Okay. Uh, in schools, interventions are aimed at preventing violence from occurring. Right. So how, this is all about how do you educate parents? Right. In schools, interventions are aimed at preventing violence from occurring, such as engaging parents in school activities that promote connections with their kids, foster communication, problem solving, limit setting, monitoring of children. Right. Zawero, I guess I probably have to take out that W. Right. So this is all about how the school nurses work with parents to foster healthy community, healthy everything within the schools in their home settings. Okay. Okay. Um, next uh, family assessment. Um, this is a combination of. It's mostly chapter eighteen. Actually, I'll take that back. Where's family assessments? Right here. These first two bullets are from chapter 19. And then the rest of the bullets in this section are from chapter 18. If you need to go back and review. Just trying to save you a little bit of time. Okay. So, um, what time is it? Okay, so let's see. How do you identify a family in crisis? That's what this first bullet is. You need to go, if you, if you don't know, there's a great little box in chapter 19 that um, talks about families in crisis, right? What is a crisis? Family's not able to cope with an event. <coughs> Becomes disorganized and dysfunctional, right? What happens when the demands of the situation exceed the resources? You're the community nurse. You have all that knowledge and list of resources. And how do you help the family? Again, next one, big, what is, not big, but what's the difference between an eco map and a genogram? Somebody please explain that to me. What's a G, what's a, what's a genogram? Without looking at this. It's, um, it's like the risk factors throughout your family. Yeah, history. It's a history, yes. right? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a history. So read this. Genomes give healthcare providers tools they need to assess their 
genomic information. So it's a genetic study going back usually three generations, you know, um, looking at those three generations and seeing what was going on. What are your risk factors? Is there lots of family members with alcoholism? Is there lots of family members with heart cardiac history? Is there lots of family members with, you know, in the last three gener generations with cancer? You can gather a lot of information about current risk factors. Okay. And same with, um, along with genograms, um, go um, genetic testing. You know, genetic testing, read about that in chapter 19. Genetic testing is a, is a really, it's typically used for the unknown. So for example, if somebody in the family was diagnosed with something that was not part of the genogram, let's say there's no family history of cancer, but somebody has cancer. Um, they may suggest you get genetic testing. Genetic testing is typically, typically reserved for kind of unknown events. But if you come from three generations of like I said, heart attacks or whatever, you pretty much know that you're going to be predisposed to that, right? Where EcoMap, on the other hand, um, is social, right? Relationship, social assessment, right? So what relationship does the family have with the community? Are they engaged? Or are they not engaged? Do they have family connections? Do they have relatives? Do they belong to school, you know, I don't know, Bible studies, churches, recreation centers, whatever. We want, the, the goal is, there's a nice, uh, there's a nice, nice picture in, in chapter 19 about an eco map. It's a circle with a family in the middle that has all these tentacles of all the social interactions that the family has. One might be relatives, one might be um, sports teams, one might meet book groups or whatever. You want the families to have social engagement in the community. Okay, that's the point, right? If you have kids sitting at home all the time, you know, not engaged socially and sitting in front of their computer, whatever, that's a concern. Isolation, depression. Okay, so that's the difference between an eco map and a genogram. Okay, an eco map represents the family's interactions with other groups and organizations. Okay, and then understand why home visits are best for assessment, right? Home visit is the best way to do an assessment. Think of all the things you can assess in a home visit. Let's say you're going into change addressing for a wound. What else? What, what other things can you assess? Environmental risks. What else? Think of all the things you can assess in a home visit. Forest, infection. Absolutely, communication, relationships, food supply. Depression. Depression, absolutely. Okay. How they interact with each other. Exactly, exactly. Okay, and then you can read through this, what things, uh, what priority things must a nurse do in order to evaluate the family? Okay, this is your ad pie. This is all part of your ad pie. Um, for those of you that have come in during the last hour, which many of you have, please put your name, your professor, and your um, campus in the chat. Okay, right here, review table 19.2. Okay. Phases, the phases of a home visit. There's five of them. There's a box. What are the phases of the home visit? Right here. What's the definition between a family structure and family function? Right? Family structure are the roles and responsibilities of the family. Right? <coughs> I'm the mom. You're the dad. You're the kid. You're the dog. You're the grandparent. You're the neighbor. Right? That's family structure. What are the roles and responsibilities or family structure? Right? There's no right model for family structure. Each family is unique. <clears throat> what are the characteristics of a healthy and unhealthy family? Remember, we talked about that functional versus dysfunctional, healthy versus unhealthy, balanced versus unbalanced. Those are all interchangeable terms. 
And there's a box in the chapter for characteristics of a functional family. What, what did we learn about reading? What's the difference? What's the main difference between a healthy family and, a dis and an unhealthy family? For purposes of this chapter, when we read that box of 12 characteristics of a healthy family, at least I did this with my group, what did we notice about that box? They all do stuff together. Perfect. It's one unit, one unit. For purposes of this chapter, family function, you want everybody doing everything together as one unit. And so when you start to see some families go to church on, some members of the family go to church on Sunday, some members of the family trust each other, some members, some, that some is the concern, right? Because it's not all. Make sense? And then last section is uh, vulnerable populations. And that is chapter 21. Chapter 21 is most of, of that. Um, vulnerable populations, okay? Um, vulnerable populations, who are they? Let's say you get a question that says, who are our vulnerable populations? Select all that apply. Or pick one, you know, pick the best answer for our homeless population. Remember, homeless, mentally ill, substance abusers, veterans, and migrant workers are all the right answers. Okay. Another important, another important um, term here are poverty. Sec second bullet, poverty is the primary source of vulnerability. P primary, that's priority, okay? We talked about this in class the last two weeks, okay? The health, the financial, the financial functioning of a family affects everything. Did we not talk about that? Okay, the, 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 the financial health of a family determines everything. It determines housing, food, clothing, education, insurance, everything. Okay. So it's not unsurprising that poverty is a primary uh, cause of vulnerability because it, it affects all of that. Okay. Another, another priority statement here, <clears throat> aging population is the greatest challenge for public health nurses. What's the important word in there? If it's a priority question, what's the, what's the word you're looking for? The greatest. Greatest. What, what, what are some least, think of priority. What would be in a priority question? Most, least, what else? Uh, greatest. I mean, you have to be able to pull out what a priority question is. You have to be able to, you know, I always tell you guys, read the question twice. You may not, you may not pick up a term in the, an important term the first time you read it. But if you have a priority question, it says, what's the priority? What's the least priority? What's the most, what's the biggest priority? What's the greatest? What's the least? So you have to be able to recognize that, All right? Another, another statement. Population growth in the world has grown due to what? We already went through this previously. It's in another section of the study guide. Increased fertility rates and decreased mortality. Thank you. Thank you. Secondary prevention. Let's see. So this goes through, this next section goes through how to care for a patient with TB. So if you need help understanding this, go back to chapter 21, uh, because part of a vulnerable population is caring for people with TB. Okay, so you can read through that section as well. And this is important. When you're interviewing with, a vulnerable, with vulnerable populations, let's say you're interviewing homeless people on the street, what do you need to consider? What are the goals? Right. So in interviewing a vulnerable population, I'm just using the homeless, it's important for the community nurse to set reasonable goals based on the baseline data you collect. Right. How do you set goals? Well, set goals collaboratively is the first step. 
Okay. There's your first step. And then set uh, culturally sensitive goals. Have them focus on teaching skills, health promotion. So this, this paragraph gives you how do we how do we start to develop a relationship and develop goals with vulnerable populations? Here's all the things we would do. Help, help your client develop self-care strategies for evaluating outcomes. For example, teach homeless individuals how to read their own TB skin test. Give them a self-addressed stamp card they can return by mail for the results. Okay. Services that, last bullet, services that have an increased impact on the population include those that focus on socioeconomic determinants such as poverty reduction, improved education. Interventions such as counseling immunizations are all designed to help individuals. Okay, so what did you pull out of this? What are some services that have an increased impact on the population? Okay, those services, the primary services are focused on socioeconomic determinants and what are some examples of socioeconomic determinants? Poverty reduction, improved education. So if you can work towards improving those, poverty reduction, improved education, you're gonna increase the healthy functioning of the communities. If you can reduce poverty reduction, improve education, So going back to all you guys, oh, nobody has their camera on, only a few people. Um, so that's your study guide. And does it help to go through it like that? Yeah, yes, yeah. thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. you really broke it down. Yeah, so, so I, mean, I mean, you need to just think of the topics in the study guide. And, you know, if you got a question that related to Family Medical Leave Act, what might it look like? If you got a question, what are the what are the two determinants of why the population is increased? Your answers are right there. So as I tell all my groups, um, the study guide is a good reflection of the expected knowledge for the exam. Um, we try and break it down to the important parts of each chapter. I mean, otherwise you're gonna be reading every chapter start to finish and we don't need to know all the information. Okay, so I really would like you to focus on making sure you understand the study guide, right? Make sure you add your notes in from lecture, you add your notes in from the review, you add your notes in from the PowerPoint, take notes all over the, all over the study guide, but in the end, you should be able to articulate, um, you should be able to articulate what's in the study guide. And if you can't, go back to the chapter and read more detail. And if you still can't understand, then reach out to your professor before the exam and say, I want to meet for five minutes. I need I have a couple of questions. Help me understand this. I just can't get the concept of primary, secondary, and tertiary. I can't. I've tried. I need you to help me with it. Okay? So break that down. Break, those, break that study guide down. Right? Think about what questions... You know, she, they've got information in here about, about family crisis. Hmm? They've got, inf what, what might they ask me about a family crisis? Maybe, maybe how do you, how do you recognize a family crisis? Maybe what interventions could, think all ad pie. What interventions could we put in place for families in crisis? Um, after we put a program in place, how do we evaluate it's working? Any of those questions could come up about family crisis. Make sense? Same with, um, you know, reviewing school nurse, what's the school nurse's role in vaccinations? We talked about it. Maybe a question would be, what do you do if the parents don't vaccinate? Or maybe the question is, what are the risk factors for kids who aren't vaccinated? Um, maybe it's, what if a parent tells you that they're not vaccinated because of this reason? What's your response? Okay. 
So just think about the types of questions that might be asked on the information presented in the study guide. Um, kids are smoking. We just talked about this. There's a whole section on smoking in the home. I don't know, a question might be, what are the risks to a kid if they live in a smoking home? Or how could you help, what interventions could you help the parent with to create a smoke-free home? Uh, what else? Think of another question. Um, what, what, what if the parent says to you, you know, gives you all these four statements? What, what, what's encouraging? Which statement is encouraging that they want to do a, have a smoke-free environment? What statement is not encouraging that you might have to do some re-education? So think of the scenarios, that's what I'm asking. Think of the scenarios that you could be asked with each of these bullet points. Make sense? I'm just trying to throw everything at you right now. Is this helpful? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Very helpful. Okay, cool. Um, you know what, if, if you understand the study guide and can articulate the study guide and think of ways that the information on the study guide might be presented to you on an exam, you will do fine on the exam. I promise you, I promise you, okay? Don't go back and start reading chapters cover to cover and don't, just don't, it's gonna be too much. We've pulled out all the information, the, the important essential knowledge information that we really want you to have a good solid understanding with, of. Okay. I'll Thank stay you, on. Ms. Marvel. Thank You're you so welcome. much. You're welcome. And Thank good you. luck. Good luck to everybody on exam one. I'll Thank stay you. on. You're welcome. I'll stay on if you guys have any questions. Good luck. Thank you.